So, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm going to um, split this into two sessions, really. The first part of it is to talk about why, why use IP at all for video distribution. So my background is video. Uh, I do anything from broadcast and film, post-production. Um, and the other half of our business is about enterprise, AV, education. So I kind of go from Game of Thrones down to a Skype presentation. It's quite a, a weird world to be in some days. Um, so first of all, talk a little bit about why you should do it. And secondly, we're talking about why you want to use video more in everything that you do. So I know there's quite a background of people here, but what we're really seeing now and what we're helping a lot of people do is to take video up to a higher quality for use in just about everything. So whether it's a corporate um, event or whether it's education, um, we have a lot of people now we're working remotely. How do we make that better, more compelling? And we think the answer is video because we've been doing it for years in television. Um, so to start with, you know, why IP? Um, traditional infrastructure, you know, we've been doing this for a long while. We've been routing signals for decades. Some people in the room longer, maybe, but uh, for a long, long time, we've been, you know, we've been sending signals around buildings and, uh, and different places. And typically what that's meant is we've had a centralized router. We've had a box that's got X number of ins and X number of outs on it. Typically, when you buy it, it's got that number of inputs and outputs on it, and you'll probably never change it unless you throw it away and buy another one. Um, they don't scale very well, you know, because of that. Usually, they're format restricted. Then normally, they're the thing you bought it for. If you've got an HDMI you know, matrix, you suddenly can't use it for SDI or HD base T or something the next day. It is what it is when you buy it. So it's not future proof. You know, it is what it is. And typically, it's industry standard hardware. Now that's okay. You know, we kind of think AV and video. We're quite a big industry. We're not. Not compared to IT. So um, you know. That's fine. Those, those products work and they do everything we need them to do, but they don't necessarily lend themselves to future proofing what you do. So, can we use IP to distribute video? Yes, we can, and for lots of reasons. Why do we want to do it? Well, first of all, we can leverage IT's spending curve. Okay, so we, we'll use this term a lot, COTS, commercial off-the-shelf equipment. If we can buy something that the IT world use in the millions, it will save us money than generating perpetual, uh, sorry, proprietary hardware. So we want to steal people like Netgear's development curves because they've got a much bigger budget than any of the video companies we work with. So that's what we're going to do. If we go over to um, IP, we can now use the distributed architecture that IP lets us have. If we want to make an IP network bigger, we can add more switches. If we want to scale it in different ways, we can move where those switches live and interlink the switches. So what we've done for years, same video, for example, is everything, as I say, goes back to a central hub. But what if I've got a campus where I've got a studio with 10 cameras in? I can put a switch there just for those cameras and route one fiber back to the core switch, and I've saved nine cable runs. It's a very, very efficient way of working. Um, POE, one of the reasons we are here to talk about you know, uh, everything is, is PoE based. Well, that straight away helps us out from a cabling point of view in the audio and video world. If we look over here, these cameras, these PTZ cameras that we're using used to require three cables. Now they require one. So it's incredibly efficient when you're rolling out large numbers of cameras. And we've been doing that in places, universities, last one we did, we put in 70 cameras. That's a hell of a lot of cabling that you've saved. Um, it's format independent. Whatever you want to run over a network, a network doesn't care what it is. It's just an IP packet. I will also say it does care what it is. There's another <laughs> but, but basically, whatever you put over there, as long as you packetize it properly and put it in that network, it will work. So when we went from HD to 4K, the data rate changed, but we didn't have to change the infrastructure that we were using. So whatever format you want to run, it can be converted in and out of the IP world if you need to go back to legacy hardware. But essentially, the core switching doesn't have to change. And if you do have to upgrade it, it's quite easy to do. And the last point, um, if you're IP, then you can be using things in hardware or software. You can run a computer that will generate that IP. You can go computer to computer, computer to switch, routing. You've got lots and lots of different choices. Suddenly, we can really, really sort of scale what we're doing in different ways. We just couldn't have done it with proprietary hardware. Um, what you'll see over here with the new tech equipment we're running, a lot of the main product there is running on a PC. Lots of graphics cards, you know, proprietary elements to it, but it's running on standard hardware, which you just couldn't have done a few years ago. 
So we think IP is absolutely the way to do this. And it doesn't really matter whether you're you know, a broadcaster or an educational facility, the same rules apply and the same benefits are there. So, a little bit about the protocols that we're using, um, and it's not just I say we, um, we're here with quite a few partners who are also running NDI systems, that AVA cameras that you see, for example, um, are all running um, on NDI as a protocol, which came from NewTek, uh, the company um, that we're here to, to distribute. Um, but they've licensed it freely for anybody to use, um, which is why it's had a very large uptake. There are literally um, thousands of applications and pieces of hardware running it. Um, when Microsoft added it to Skype, they added 1.5 billion users overnight, which not many people get to say in the video world. It was quite popular. It's now part of Teams, it's part of Zoom, and it's part of other things as well. But it's royalty free, that's the key. And you can implement it in software or hardware. So if you are a programmer, the um, SDK is free. Within about half an hour, you could be running NDI in and out of applications. It's very quick. But if you want to run a hardware system, like the cameras are here, for example, then there's chips that you can buy or you can use your own ASICs in there. So it really um, is really very flexible in how you deploy it. And it's been around for six years, which is actually a relatively long time in a lot of these things. So it's mature. We're on version 5.5 now. But one of the key things that I'm going to come back to here is horses for courses. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, IPMX as well. In the broadcast world, a 4K signal is 12 gigabits a second, which is about here. You know, when we're running NDI, we're talking about 200 megabits a second. It's quite a big difference. And what that means is we can use standard gigabit, gigabit networks that most people have already got. Right now, on some of the network vendors, they're looking at 18 months delay for some of their larger core switches, if you want to be running those kind of 25 gig kind of systems. So this means we can fit everything nice and neatly in a 1 or a 10 gigabit bearer. So it's very, very efficient. Um, so next part with NDI, we want it to be easy to set up. So one of the advantages um, of traditional systems is if I've got an HDMI cable, I know it's an HDMI output and I know what's on it. With networks, it gets a little bit harder. So within NDI, um, it has a system for automatically setting up and discovery protocols built in. So any device you put on the network says, hi, I'm a camera, I can do this. And then the central system can browse it, find it, and add it to its pool of devices. So it's a much simpler way of working in the IP world without you having to go into the nuts and bolts um, to configure it. Okay, so nice thing is I've talked about a fair bit about this. So how does that work in the real world? So if we put a network together, this gigabit ethernet network that you're running, I add a device, and I've got a mixer which is going to receive that device. So over here what we're showing is the mixer which can take you know, many, many different inputs and create a single output. That input could be a camera, that input could be a Teams call. It's very flexible in the way it works. So we add a new device on the network, lots of devices on the network, and that immediately says, hello, using MDNS, I am an X, I am called this. And our mixer then looks for that, we browse it, we add it to the system, and now we open a port from the device to the mixer. Now, right now, we support unicast and multicast, so there are advantages in the way that the system works if you're into your networking. Um, if you've got a multicast network, we can really bring the traffic down. We can use NDI for signage as well as um, production um, type uses as well. In this case, when we're working, when we're previewing the video on a mixer, when we're just looking to see what we're going to pick, it runs at a lower bit rate. 40 megabits, for example. But once I cut that up to my main display, I run up to 150 megabits or 200 megabits. So I'm keeping my network really, really balanced and the use really efficient. NDI HX is very similar, but a much lower bit rate. So we have two flavors of NDI, full NDI and NDI HX. So if you're in a sort of AV kind of environment, if you're in a university or a school or something like that, they're not going to notice the difference in the quality. It doesn't add anything to that kind of system. So you can bring your bit rates down about 10x. So down from sort of 200 odd to around the 15, maybe to 50 megabits range. And the key with NDI is it's resolution independent, frame rate independent, color space independent. If anything changes, if you need to upgrade, you don't need to change anything but the device that you're using or update the software and it will work. So already NDI is spec'd up to 8K. 
everyone's trying to push 8K monitors um, at the minute, but no one's got any 8K sources or doesn't really care about it. So, but we're there architecturally for it to work. So there are some of the vendors that are working with NDI, um, many of them in this room already. Um, Netgear, a shout out to them. Uh, their AV line of switches are incredible and work really, really well with NDI and with Dante and with IPMX, a lot of the things we're going to be talking about. And they are the first network switch vendor I've seen that's taken the AV world seriously. So now when you get their products, you go to the web UI and say, I want this port here to be an NDI port with Dante. It goes in and does all the setup for you, immediately ready for use, puts the POE for your camera, whatever on there, and away you go. It significantly improves how long it takes you to roll out a system. So if you've not looked at Netgear, um, I really advise that you do. They've done some really good qualifications in the way that a lot of the other companies haven't even looked at. You know, it's, it's, it's been um, very impressive. Uh, but as I say, Ava are here. We're running their cameras on the network. In fact, anyone here who's showing, um, uh, giving us a, an NDI source, you can see and cut up from our desk over there. So what that means in a nutshell is that NDI as a protocol uh, fits in a number of different applications. It fits in meeting rooms, it can fit in auditoria, studios, multi-purpose areas. You can use it for signage, you can use it for production. It's really straightforward. You can go to their website, ndi.tv, download the toolkit, you can run it on a laptop, you can generate your own material. In this case here, we're running an NDI screen share, so anything on this laptop comes out in this monitor via a decoder that's down there. Again, this is a Keeler View decoder um, that's working on PoE2. IPMX, um, I mentioned, um, our friends at Matrox are here uh, talking a little bit more about this. It's another protocol that enables you to use um, a variety of different codecs within it um, at various different bit rates. Its heart comes from a broadcast standard, the SMPTE 2110 standard, which is uncompressed, quite unwieldy, very complicated to set up. It's taken the good bits of that and really shrunk it down into something that's much more friendly, much more usable, much more controllable. And they've allowed you to run different codecs within it, so you can pick a codec that fits your application. So when we look here, as I say, uncompressed, we're looking at 12 megabits, or 12 gigabits, sorry, for uncompressed 4K. But if you lightly, moderately, highly, you know, compress that, depending on your application, you can massively change what you do. And one of the problems with 12 gigabit, which is uncompressed 4K, is it doesn't fit, and this is going to sound obvious, it doesn't fit inside a 10 gigabit connector. So that means you've got to go up to a 25 gigabit connector, which makes it three times the price. <laughs> so if you just compress that a little bit and got it down to below 12 gig, something like this, suddenly your networking costs go down massively. But that's not the direction the broadcast guys went. They said, we're uncompressed, we're amazing. But the real world, everything's compressed because why wouldn't you do it? So here's some just examples here of where you know, we can be down into the, you know, into the tens of megabits, really, really getting everything you can out of your network without stressing it. And one of the things we note is if you're talking to IT people or if you're talking to customers about AV over IP, get the IT people involved at the earliest stage possible and make sure they're happy. Because IT people that are briefed are nice people. IT people that find out later on you want to put video over the network tend to get in the way and block you. So look after the IT people. What we often do is put it on a separate network anyway, because it keeps it nice and clean. And we say to the IT people, is that okay if we put it on our own network and you can handle the handoff point between the two of them? And they generally go, yeah, because I haven't got to do anything. So that's my recommendation if you take nothing else out of this uh, conversation. Okay, so um, that's IP in general, why you should use IP for videos. Anyone got any questions um, around that? Good, okay. Well, I'm gonna be over there if you wanna to speak to me. <laughs> this next bit's a bit more fun. So this is really about why you should use video. So um, I, I started in this presentation about three years ago and we talked about disruption. This is a new disruptive technology IP. I'm putting video over IP. And we did this just before COVID. Um, and it turns out nothing was as disruptive as COVID. You know, this came on board um, you know, lots of uh, te terrible stuff happened, obviously, from COVID. But what has happened with it is it's generated massive change and in a very short period of time. I, I keep coming back to this graphic. If you ever see one of my presentations at the minute, it will be in there. The thought is that COVID drove seven years of transformation in one year. 
people that said we can't work from home, we can't work from re you know, remotely, it is not possible, all of a sudden it was possible because it had to be. There were no other choices. And it's changed the world for better or for worse forever. We will not go back to the same ways of working. We have new normals, we keep hearing that. But you know, it has changed and it's opened a lot of conversations with a lot of companies. And what's it changed? Well, when COVID hit, all this stuff stopped. <laughs> These sort of things, you know, in-person events, it's just nice we're getting back to them now. I really like this, you know, going out for a drink and a meal and talking. It's how we do business. But that stopped for a couple of years. So how did we, you know, what do we do? We had to replace this stuff in some way. And it also meant that budgets changed. People who were sending 1,000 people out to Las Vegas for three days to do a sales launch. That's nuts when you think about it, isn't it? You know, so... We also were doing learning and training and demos. We had to find new ways of doing these things. So, you know, a lot of people in this room suddenly put their hands up and said, well, we've got systems that can do that. You know, we can help you. And so, you know, we've all had to change what we do and share it. And this is just another slide I love. You know, we're not where we were, right? You know, the whole world has changed and it ain't going to go back. So what did we do? Well, first of all, we all moved online. Right? Zoom did really well for a while. Um, and teams became less shit. One of the good things out of COVID, <laughs> so there's no one from Microsoft here, I keep getting in trouble for that, but teams used to be pretty bad, now it's less shit, which is a great thing. So, but Zoom did really well, all of a sudden we moved everything onto Zoom, right? But then we ended up coming up with this new term, we had to even learn new terms about being bored online, and this grid blindness, all of a sudden you're staring at the, you know, a thousand dead eyes on the screen or wondering why you're there. Um, and so, you know, it, didn't, it doesn't work for everything. You can't just shift everything you were doing online and expect nothing to change. Um, I did a search on, <laughs> on COVID, boring, and face mask, and the AI generated this. It's quite a harrowing image. But, you know, some stuff on screen is boring. It is dull. And what we don't want is people at home. If you've got a sales force at home you're trying to talk to about your quarterly release or your new software or your new product or whatever, you don't want them doing the ironing or doing the gardening or wandering around doing the washing. And if you've worked from home, I know you've done those things, because we all have. Right? Mostly, I've developed a big relationship with the Amazon delivery guy, who's, I'm godfather to his children now, it's nice. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want our people distracted. We want them to learn, to listen, to be part of what we do. And how do we do that? Well, we think television's the answer, right? We're all pretty good at watching telly. We've, we've been doing it for a long while. You know, the, the Lord Reith, the BBC Director General originally said it was to inform, educate and entertain. That's what telly should do. That was the remit behind the BBC. It still exists now. So it does. We watch the news to get information. We watch documentaries to learn. We watch live events because football's quite popular, apparently. And, you know, live works really well. You can do a pre-record, but actually there's an energy that exists in live stuff that doesn't exist anywhere else but you don't want to do it in a boring manner. A CEO with a laptop pointing up their nose giving a presentation isn't good. And that's what a lot of people were doing during COVID. You know, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies looking like they were on a sort of 1989 ZX Spectrum. You know, it's not a good thing. But we also want to keep the good things. We want on demand. We're a Netflix generation now. So what do you want to do? You know, if you've got a, a large organization, you might want to time shift something. So I want the people in America to be able to watch it after I've done the launch in Berlin. You know, so we still want to create the things that we like and you know, that television has. We want to get information back. And a lot of the systems that we have now will tell us who's watching, how long they watched for, you know, what was boring, what wasn't. Because you can learn from that and you can make your presentations better. There's lots of information. You look at platforms like Vimeo, you know, this stuff... Um, it is freely available and it really tells you what's going on. We want to now be able to take content from anywhere. We want to be able to have a broadcast set up, but we might want to take a call from a Teams call or a Zoom call because that's the way that the person who wants to come online, the CEO from their private island or you know, somebody from home, one of the things that COVID did is democratise who's on telly. So what used to happen in news, it was the person that was closest to the studio who could get in was the person that you heard about, that was the expert. Now you've got a mum who's an expert in the Middle East, in Aberdeen, who can be on TV because she's got a camera, her webcam, that's all it takes. So we wanna get that kind of thing into our productions using tools that we already have. And mobile phones have got great cameras on them now. 
If you get it right, there's some very high quality stuff you can get hold of, which is production ready. We can bring it in. And what we're showing over here is that we can take a Teams call or a Zoom call or something along those lines, extract the content, and it's now a source that we can do something with. So that CEO on their private island, we can take her off of this sort of basic picture and we can put her in a virtual set and make it look like she's on the news. And it works. People notice it because it doesn't look crap. Crap stuff doesn't engage people. Now, we want to utilize the space we have in offices. Offices have changed, right? We're not putting in so many 300 people conference rooms. Well, maybe we are, but you know, the big conference rooms are empty in most places. So why don't we turn it into a studio? Make it a multi-purpose room so that when we are doing a product launch, we can do it well, we can make it better. We did it in our office. When COVID hit, we turned the corner of our engineering office into a studio like this, and we started doing online demos and webinars and engaging people in a way that wasn't just a PowerPoint. We did it as a production. It didn't cost a lot of money, and it really engaged people. They, they enjoyed watching it. We brand our content. We make it look like us. Again, with Skype, with those teams, most people don't really brand their content. We want to put graphics on it. We want to say, this is my training course. This is my university. This is our IP. This is us. And make it look like a TV show. If you look at Channel 4 News, you know you're looking at Channel 4 News. So do it right. Take pride in your video and make it look like a real program. We need it to be secure. So we've got systems that allow you to encrypt the content before you send it out to make sure that your crown jewels, that really important information that you're sharing about your new product, only goes to the people it goes to. Video is a great way of doing that as well. You're not just bumping a PDF out there that can be sent. You're live streaming something. And people engage with it in that way, and they take it on board better. And we want to take some of the stuff we've learned from broadcast about being resilient and bringing it into the AV world. So your stream won't break because we've got multiple you know, services running of it, multiple services, multiple copies and backups. So that if you are a bank giving your, you know, your, your yearly broadcast out to your brokers, that they don't see this stream break and suddenly think, well, is our IT any good? Am I trusting the trades that are happening on that system? Banks get very nervous about stuff that looks bad on any broadcast because they think it reflects on them. So build that in, do it properly, treat it like a broadcast job and you won't go wrong. So we're not in Kansas anymore, absolutely, but we're somewhere new and we think it's better. We think that what we can do actually will save you money. When you look at some of those big events, these corporate events where you send the salespeople halfway around the world, we can put a 4K TV studio in for less than the price of the bar bill. Now the biggest problem is finding out who signs that off. So it used to be a travel budget and it used to be a marketing budget, but we want to get bits of that and we want to turn it into a TV studio. But education want to go remote and they're competing with every other educational facility. So they want it to look good and they want it to be them and they want it to be noticed and of a high quality. So we can do that. All of those different use cases, we've got solutions that help. So to finish off there, we want to sell better tools to create compelling content. If your content looks good, eyes will stay on the screen. Make it look like telly. We've got flexible infrastructure to do it. We can bring the cost down. POE is part of that tool. You know, we've talked about IPMX, talked about NDI. We can use those things to make really, really flexible systems that are scalable, that work, dependable, um, and uh, cost you know, a, a, a very compelling price. Mm -hmm.